welcome everyone uh, good morning thanks for joining us today um, uh, we have uh, uh, welcome to track 3 first of all and we have uh, babu and gajendran um, thank you so much for joining uh, we are very glad to have you um, and um, today's uh, session by babu and gajendran is all about building a highly scalable apm infrastructure with uh, terraform and uh, kubernetes cluster um, and before I hand it over to Babu, just a quick reminder for the attendees, uh, please use the Q&A section um, and not the chat box uh, so that uh, on the last 10 minutes when Babu and Gajendran uh, would have an opportunity to answer your questions, they will have a consolidated, consolidated view of uh, your questions uh, and um, your questions may not be missed, right? Uh, with that, I uh, hand over to Babu. Over to you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great morning. Good evening could be. Uh, wonderful see, to see a lot of people joining us today and truly thankful for you joining with us today. And I also have uh, Gajendran, my co-speaker, a great friend of mine. Uh, we have been working together for a very long time. Hello, hi. And we are in the same office today. So pretty much we'll get started. And uh, thanks for joining again. And great to see so many Appium contributors right here today. All right. And if you have questions, as Manoj said, you please post it. And if you wanted to talk to us, please do that. Thank you so much. We'll get started. And this is all about a case study of about how to highly scalable Appium Infra, right? And, and the, one of the projects that I work is for a North American retailer, sports retailer. And they had about 80 million users across different applications, right? Including a lot of web. And they also moved to a sports game app and which is truly about 1 million mobile users for the last one and a half years, right? And considering it's been a huge volume of users coming into the system, a lot of people trying to interact to the different mobile apps, right? And the testing was quite challenging because the number of users are going up every single week and the code base started also growing over the time, right? And the real challenge came out here is the testing approaches that we have to do considering an automation work. One of the key asks is how about the test coverage? What kind of coverage you will do with the real and simulators, right? And considering we have been testing around from seven onwards Android and going up to 12, that was the expectation. And the other ask is from how about the test execution speed? Because we are truly, truly on a DevOps world. And the expectation is all about, okay, get all our test results bundled within 60 minutes so that we can have a faster feedback. So this is what the case study about, but considering the non-disclosure agreement, we'll be running on a different apps today, but very, very closest possible demo today. So we'll get started with the context. And here is the application framework that being developed for this particular customer, right? And this is truly built on a hybrid app, which is built on an Ionic. Most of the components are built on Angular, right? For anything on a regular components. And wherever we had something to do with the native conversations, like file uploads, we had photos or scanning of the particular barcodes on the retail sector. So we had a lot of Cordova plugins, which is built under the Ionic native. And we had the TypeScript, which is doing most of the heavy weight activity. And we had the HTML components predominantly written on the uh, style sheets with the JavaScript pretty much on the client side and which completely packaged both on the Play Stores and App Stores, and then converted back into the apps for us, right? Uh, for today's uh, particular presentation, we are focusing more on the Android Appium, and uh, the reason being too many. So considering the time is one of the bigger challenge, right? So, all right, uh, let me start about what is the mobile automation uh, expectations we had while starting this project, right? There were four. Right. One is the compatibility. The compatibility is all about starting from at least somewhere about eight all the way to 11 and 12. Right. That's one of the one. For iOS also, we had a very similar iOS versions to hit until 12, which is basically the different iPhones and iPads that we have to run against. And as I told you, the faster feedback that we are trying to run. And we had closely about dozens of test environments, truly. And we had too many test environments, too many apps to run. So which is being catered across multiple hubs. So that's exactly what we wanted to hold and absolutely a scaled automation that we wanted to do because of the volume of work that have been doing, right? And finally, as everyone says, 
the lowest execution cost. Right, tail end, we'll also talk about the costing that we had in the solution, which will be truly, truly amazing, how much really worth it when you want to really scale up, okay? And then the biggest challenge we had is considering this customer has 1 million users across board, and we have to do a lot of activity right here. We looked at the models across the uh, North America space, and especially we looked at California, uh, predominantly most of the users were coming from California. So we looked at the models across the state. Uh, we understood the focus area the customers are looking at. And truly we used Pareto first, then we do Pareto of Pareto, which becomes 20% of 20%, the 4% of the devices that we took. And then we started looking at them with the real devices. We looked at some of the cloud providers to run against them because we don't have the complete cloud form locally. So we looked at some of the cloud forms to run the real devices. But truly that was not working for us when it is a virtual devices because too many virtual devices to run for us truly right with that said the challenges are a vital few so we picked them packed them under real devices and then moved most of them under simulators that gave us a huge advantage under the cost and the coverage truly for us and then this challenge number two as i spoke right on the daily qa bells we sometimes we get three bells a day sometimes one bell but truly too many bells for us to really handle multiple environments doesn't so we have to really scale up really well to cater we don't know when the request is coming from each environment so we truly wanted some multiple hubs to handle different services so we have to do a lot of tires that's how uh, i hooked up with gaj and helping me in building a scalable model and then test is supposed to be less than a half of an activity right and then challenge number three, right? When we decided to build our own services, the biggest challenge is, okay, we had multiple cloud providers. Uh, we looked for different options, right? What, what they have been doing, it's very, very expensive. Something started about $1,500. Sometimes it's even costlier than that when we want more than eight parallel uh, device runs and so on. Too many managing dependencies for us to handle. So it, it was a smaller team. We don't want to spend a lot of time in enabling those so we looked up for solutions which can help us to spend a little time, which can help us, right? And then once we thought, okay, let's build our own solutions. And the first thing we hit this is, how about the AWS cloud as a POC? One of the challenges that we really will talk about later today is the nested virtualization, which when we started at AWS cloud, we try spinning up the AWS cloud and any EC2 mission by default, you don't get the nested virtualization, right? The Selenium web driver nodes were running pretty fine, but when we go to the Appium nodes, it was really, really failing. So nested virtualizations made us to really look up for a bare metal. And bare metal is a little expensive, but we'll talk about how to keep it very, very low as we progress today, right? And then we thought, okay, this is good working for us. And when we get the customer and they said, like, we can have a multiple cloud, it doesn't have to be always AWS. Right, so we have to look back and see how to make it cloud agnostic and multiple cloud. So we thought, okay, let's experiment and Azure and GCP also, we had a similar challenges on the configuration that will take you through on that too, right? And then we took one step backwards. We started building the Terraform configurations and which can help you to spin any cloud machines. You configure that particular environment with the keys and you should be able to spin probably in three to five minutes spinning any particular cloud environment for you. That, that's basically done. And that execution being done from the test automation framework engine. For example, if you're using Selenium WebDriver or RPM, so you can able to spin with your test runners, could be like Mocha, or if you're running TestNG or JUnit, whatever could be, you could be able to do that at the startup kind of activity. We should be able to scale up your environment as well at runs, right? So that's a fundamental great ask, and we could do it really, really well. And here is a complete landscape of what we really, really built for that particular scenario, right? And we started with a Jenkins pipeline in our case, which had a trigger based on every build that we're getting onto our test environment and which hit the code repos and bit buckets and then coming to a build tool like a Maven and then making a build on our test and then we have to start our RPM test or Selenium WebDriver test. And when we have to start the test runner, we have to look up for where are we, our load balance, right? So the load balance are pre-configured. We had a static IP on the AWS 
uh, but the Terraform can help you to scale it up or Terraform can help you to deploy the pods for you. So the first thing Terraform really kicks off is basically it talks to the uh, command line interface to deploy uh, the basic nodes, right? And then we use the API to find out how many are running, what is that we need on the queue. So we should be able to apply a scaling algorithm and which helped us to understand how many more nodes we might need and helped us to really, really scale up. So, but we had, we always have a minimum one node. That's, that's a basic node that we have. And we had a replica set based on your demand. The replica set can grow up. Actually the bare metal, I think if I'm right, 64 nodes is what we could do uh, for RPM trustfully really, really well. For if you are using a Selenium web driver nodes could be even a few hundred nodes. That's what we could really manage up to, right? On a bare metal, right? I three. Uh, I three, right? I three. So right. So and then we also have a standalone selenium hub. Again, minimum one hub. It could be able to scale up, depends on how it is. I think we could be able to scale up for every 24 right uh, uh components, right? Or when we reach the uh, nodes about 24, we scale up the next hub related to connect with that particular hub, right? So we could be able to use the load balancer smartly. The hub request is taken by the load balancer. So this is pretty workable solution and it works for any web driver API as well. Uh, if you are using anything like web driver IOS or uh, protractor or or even uh, the similar solutions, we are looking at how to implement on Puppet Eats or uh, any of the solutions, but it truly, truly works on an RPM uh, components very, very well. Okay, and quickly talking about the monitoring service that we have in place. So we built a Spring Boot service app and um, thanks to Amit uh, who built the solution. We looked up for the solution. We wrote the customization on top of it. We made little more tweaks to make it to work. And the Spring Boot service app uh, is currently returned and deployed under the Kubernetes as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the standalone mission. And uh, basically it sends a API request to uh, both at the same time to the Selenium grid to find out how many queued requests we have. And also it tried to identify how many active parts we have in place. So it, it tried to keep looking at it. Currently we configured them as like 60 plus 10 seconds, 70 seconds, but you could be able to do it, leverage it at the configuration level at runtime depends on what you really, really need, right? Uh, this applies basically for both for scaling up or scaling it down, right? So it, it could do that either ways in that case, right? This monitoring service come back and tell us just the information about how many nodes are available, how many parts are running, all that, how many queued, all that. But the scheduler service is a second one based on the monitoring, if you have to scale up or scale down. So the algorithm goes and start sending a request to them, um, Kubernetes API to scale up or scale down. And similarly, it also try understanding on the Selenium grid, how many queued, because unless we know how many queued, we don't know how many have to scale up, right? So you can either control the amount of scaling either from your test runners like TestNG, how many parallel threads you want to run, or at the grid level, how many nodes you wanted to maintain, or at the Kubernetes level, if you had a huge infrastructure, then you can go ahead to the Kubernetes level configure them how many max nodes you want to do it. For the demo, we have about 20 nodes, which could be able to do it very, very well for us, right? So that, that's how a kind of services that we have put into place. And, and truly, before I hand over for the demo with uh, Gudge, I just want to communicate one thing, right? The infrastructure cost that we did, uh, truly building our own solutions today with the Terraform, with a AWS cloud, right? And we, we have been hitting closely about $1,200 on a cloud provider. Uh, that too, with a limitation, you cannot run more than eight parallel tests. If you want to really achieve your test suites to complete less than a hour, and you, you would end up in about uh, running more than a hour or sometimes beyond two hours too with the retries in place, right? It's a very expensive model and also a very time consuming model. And uh, basically on, on our several execution runs and uh, uh, with a dedicated I, uh, cloud uh, machine with I3 Metal, you could able to do it in 150 US dollars and roughly running about two hours per test, which would hit you 150 if you're running every single day. I think two hours is too much to run. If you're running thousand tests, you should be able to do it. Uh, right? And by the way, that is I3 Metal comes with a 64 parallel CPUs and, and you can be able to run even with the one CPU running a one yeah, RPM test and you should be able to do it. And 
We spend on so many Selenium web driver tests parallelly, which could be able to do it truly, truly well, right? So that, that's a huge take for us to do it. And uh, Gaj also will talk to you about in case if you wanted to keep it even cheaper than this, you could be able to call an API uh, to start, kickstart your on-demand uh, uh, request, which should be able to help you to do that, okay? So with that said, I'm going to turn it over uh, to the demo to Gaj. So uh, let me stop sharing. And we'll run the PPT first. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. And then we'll go. Uh, sure, sure. I'll so go ahead. let me describe uh, what is the kind of demo setup uh, what we have. And once uh, I walk through in the presentation, I'll just show you the actual uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, configuration files. And then I'll walk through you how our setup is currently there. And then Babu will start uh, uh, sending a request to, to Selenium Hub to run a, to run some IPM test, say one request initially, and then uh, we'll uh, upgrade it to two requests uh, next time, then four requests, and we'll see how the uh, scaling up of our nodes are uh, the, happening in the Kubernetes in, in a real time. This is a real AWS Elastic Kubernetes service. What we have created. So step number one, what we have done. Step number one, we have created a AWS Elastic Kubernetes service, right? So in order to do that, there are two ways. Either you do it via Terraform directly, right? So Terraform will give you a cloud agnostic way of building uh, the, uh, say, infrastructure. And using Terraform, we can build a cloud agnostic way of uh, Kubernetes cluster in multiple clouds. So TCP or AWS or Azure. But in this lab setup, so for this particular demo, uh, we used a a tool called EKS CTL. That's a command line tool, uh, which is uh, provided by uh, AWS. Uh, that is recommended by AWS, of course. And also the AWS, uh, uh, say, CLI tool has been installed. And ba based on these two command line uh, infrastructure, we created a, a EKS cluster. While creating the EKS cluster, we told what is a node instance type. So the worker nodes, which is a part of the Kubernetes cluster, we need to tell what type of node we need to run. Since uh, the Android, uh, 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 say Docker image can is uh, requesting need a nested virtualization. We use the i3 dot metal uh, instance type in AWS. So that's the only instance type which will support for the nested virtualization. Although it seems to be costly, if you go to AWS and look into this i3 dot metal cost, it seems to be very costly. But so in AWS there is an option called spot instances, right? So there are like three kinds of instances in AWS. One, we call it as on-demand. By default, everything is on-demand. The second one is going to be, we call it as reserve instance. The third one, we call it as a spot instance, right? So spot instance, uh, comparing with uh, the on-demand instance will reduce 83% of the cost. So practically, if you see for one hour, we just spend $1.2 or $1 per, per hour, right? So that's the cost what uh, we have seen in the AWS uh, costing uh, uh, application. And that seems to be, Oh, okay, so let's go to the next one. Once our cluster is ready, then we use this spot instance and we, we have uh, defined that. Then we deployed the Selenium Hub uh, as a Kubernetes spot. We deployed uh, yeah external load balancer. So to access the Selenium Hub running inside the cluster, we deployed a AWS load balancer to access that particular Selenium Hub. See all parts which is running inside Kubernetes will not have access to outside world. Because Kubernetes will create a VPC, a virtual uh, private cloud, in order to uh, say run the parts inside uh, our uh, Kubernetes. So we need to expose those services to outside world via this particular uh, uh, load balance. Then we deployed the Android uh, uh, Docker Android pod, which run, which runs uh, the RPM as well as the uh, simulator for uh, Android. Android 11 is used and. Uh, we deployed one minimum. So minimum size is going to be one, which has which been uh, uh, deployed. Next, let me show these things and then uh, we'll come back to the presentation. I'll just uh, switch my, I'll share my screen now. I hope my screen is uh, visible to everyone. As I told you, this is a real, uh, say, EKS cluster. And we have configured, this is one of, one of the AWS machine what you are seeing. It's a, a AWS uh, EC2 instance. Here we have 
define the context for the Kubernetes cluster and the kubectl command will run here. So in kubectl command, I will, I will get, get all command will tell you the list of uh, Kubernetes resources which have been deployed. So there is a pod, there are two pods now, which is, which is running in the Kubernetes cluster. And there is, this is, we call it as a service Kubernetes service. And look at the load balancer, what uh, we have. This is a public, uh, uh, say, URL. Anybody will be able to access this particular public URL. And then there is a deployment and there is a replica set. Replica set, number of instances, what we want. Currently, it is running as one instance. But Selenium Hub, one instance is there. And then the, uh, say, the Appium uh, Android Docker uh, instance, one instance is running. So this is the current state of the uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster. And if we go and look into our Selenium hub, we can get all those information. See, so the I'll just refresh the load balancer now. So once I refresh the load balancer, it shows there is a uh, Android uh, node which has been connected with the underlying Selenium hub. And this will be used to execute the underlying uh, test cases, right? So now, also, the other thing what we need to know about is our uh, autoscaler uh, component, which is currently running. I'll talk about this autoscaler component later, probably in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. But now, this is a Spring Boot application, which is currently running, and it is going to print what is the available node and what is the BC node and what is the current request, which is coming to the Selenium hub. So currently, we have only one available node. There is no BC node, and the, the request uh, coming to Selenium hub is zero now and it shows all these three uh, numbers here. And uh, we should start one test now, and we will uh, test it. And then we'll scale up with two, and all the, slowly we will do that. So, Babu, can we run one first test, only one request, and let's see what's happening. So, uh, I request Babu to run uh, one test uh, hitting that particular uh, load balancer, which is going to go to... Yeah, the request is sent, Chikaj. Okay. Can you look at the control? So now if you see the request, it is at, it, it received the request and it is executing this particular request. Uh, so you can see that. And if you see here, the busy node has changed to one. Available node is zero, right? So busy node has been changed to one. And this request is uh, running uh, currently. Once uh, this request is completed, again, you will see the available node as one and busy node as zero. Once we reach that particular state, we are going to run it with the And automatically you will see one, only one request will run. The other request will be queued. And our autoscaler, what, what, the screen what you are seeing, will identify that. And it is going to make an API call to Kubernetes to increase the number of parts. And once the Kubernetes parts got in incremented, and you will see available nodes uh, uh, will become uh, uh, like uh, one. And busy nodes is already one. And then the available node will be uh, used to serve the uh, queued request which is there in uh, Selenium, so the busy nodes will become. So let's uh, uh, do that now. Uh, this this is completed, right? Uh, oh, the, the first request. The request is still running. Okay. okay, I think it is completed. Now, if you see the available nodes has become one, the busy nodes have become zero. Okay, and if you go and uh, check here, I will refresh this. And now the. Uh, node is going to be free now because the test got completed and the node has become free. It's not busy now, it, it got free now. So now, uh, Bobo step number two will uh, run uh, two requests now and let's see what's going to happen. With that, we go with the two requests. It should be coming in very closely now. Can you check? So since there is only one node running, so the, another request is being queued and our autoscaler will identify this particular uh, number of uh, requests queued based on some scheduler. This auto autoscaler is running based on a scheduler and uh, probably every minute uh, it's going to go and check. And if some request is running in queue, automatically this autoscaler will, will uh, trigger a Kubernetes API call to scale the current pod into uh, two parts. If you see, there is a message came in and it is, uh, it is uh, running that particular, uh, calculating that particular uh, uh, number of nodes required, and then it uh, it requested to scale up the underlying system. So there's a Kubernetes API which is going to do that, and your uh, parts, number of parts is going to become two now. 
and you we can see that as well here in the cube ctl so i'll run cube ctl again if you see here automatically the second part should have got created see here now magically there's two parts got came into picture and there are two uh, say replica set which is automatically came we didn't do do this manually the auto scaler has created this manually for you and we saw a message in the auto scaler that can you has, also show the console yes yeah. So if you go to the console, we will get uh, two uh, nodes now. See, so it's there with two nodes. Yeah. See, then there is a cooling period. Once the uh, say test cases got executed, so there is a cooling period. Like every uh, 60, 70 seconds is the uh, scheduler what we have kept, and within that particular 70 seconds, it's if there is no more request, it has to come back to the original state. Original state is the node is going to be one, right? So uh, that's the original state. It has to come back to that. So there will be a scale down request which will be triggered, uh, which will make uh, the underlying uh, node to be one. See, currently it is telling available node is one and busy node is one. The next uh, uh, execution of the autoscaler will trigger a scale down uh, kind of request. And you will see scale down is required and then the current state will become one. And once the state is going to become one, if we rerun the kubectl command, you will see only one pod, which is our Appium pod, which is running the underlying Android emulator. So the one pod will come into picture. So automatically, the logic is going to be like, based on the request coming to the Selenium hub, the autoscaler will read that particular number of requests, and it is going to increment the number of parts required in the Kubernetes cluster. And once the parts got created, it is going to come and attach with the Selenium hub, and the requested uh, uh, test case will get connected with the new, uh, say, part what we have created, and it is going to execute. So in this particular approach, we are able to uh, scale up and scale down automatically. And let's go and run uh, the uh, four parallel instances now and see how things are going to be. Let me see here. See here, there is a scale down request case. See? And the number of uh, requests uh, is going to be like reduced now to one. And you can see here, here as well. So now it is terminating. And the scale down request came because of that, the one is terminating. So we'll run four parallel requests, Babu, and see what's going to happen now. So we are running four parallel requests now. And let's see what's going to happen. So we have four parallel requests has been triggered and there should be again a scale up, uh, uh, say a request will get uh, fired from our autoscaler that is going to create the uh, Kubernetes uh, pod for our RPM nodes. And then that four uh, uh, test cases will get executed, right? So this, this uh, uh, scaling up and scaling down uh, logic is not using the horizontal part scaler, which is already there in Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes has two kinds of, uh, uh, say, auto scaler, horizontal part and vertical parts uh, auto scaler. That is going to be based on CPU and uh, say memory and all those things. So, so you can have something like this. Uh, for uh, last two minutes or last one minute, if your CPU usage is going to be like 90% right, or 95% and your RAM usage is going to be like 95%. So this horizontal part scaler can be configured in such a way that we can dynamically create another uh, part where our instances of instance of our application, another copy or another replica will run and it will auto connect with the load balancer, which is already there inside the uh, Kubernetes, right? And that kind of approach won't work for this use case because this use case is not based on CPU usage or memory usage. It's going to be based on, uh, uh, say, the number of requests coming, right? So based on the number of requests, we will be able to uh, say, have a feature to scale up or scale down. And that's the reason why we changed the logic into a different kind of approach, where based on the number of requests, we are going to scale up and scale down. So occasionally we used to uh, get uh, uh, these kind of unable to connect IO exception and all those things. So the reason behind why we uh, we getting is like, so when the parts are going to scale down, when the termination is happening, right? So that's now we saw the part is getting terminated. So it is going to be read, uh, taken out from our load balancer as well. So at, at that point of time, say for 30 seconds or something like, like that, 
the load balancer is not responding right so so that kind of behavior what we saw in the uh, amazon eks uh, cluster right so now if you see our uh, pod got reduced only one pod is there and the desire uh, say sizes and everything is going to be like one now we will be able to uh, yeah. say trigger a request again before that can we quickly run through the scaling algorithm for a moment yeah right let's stop sharing and let me get into the sharing let's do that so can we quickly talk about the scaling algorithm please okay so scaling algorithm inside kubernetes is based on cpu and memory this is a kind of custom scaling algorithm what uh, uh, we have created based on the uh, say request which is queued in with uh, selenium so what happens what is actually happening in the autoscaler uh, spring boot application is like so that will have yeah, api connectivity uh, api call with our selenium hub as well as uh, with uh, our uh, kubernetes uh, api so kubernetes is having this kind of feature so all functionalities what we can do in kubernetes by like uh, creating a new node pod uh, say load balancer everything can be uh, done via an api call also so kubernetes has all those things as part of api call as well so what we do is like basic logic is like we go and hit selenium and find out what is the number of requests which is queued in in selenium so based on that particular number of requests uh, we will go and see what is the current uh, number of nodes which is there inside our uh, kubernetes and if the number of nodes are less than the number of requests which is there in the selenium hub we will make an kubernetes api call to increase the number of nodes dynamically right so based on the number of requests which is there in the selenium hub uh, we, we will be increasing the number of nodes which is which is there in the underlying uh, kubernetes and next time when the scheduler is going to run if there is no if zero request is queued inside our uh, selenium hub and the number of instances which is there inside our kubernetes is going to be like eight or ten or whatever we will automatically scale down to the minimal level which is probably like one instance we will automatically scale down to the minimal level of course we will check if the node is if the pod is busy if pod is running some test case we don't do that if pod is not busy then we will scale down to the minimal uh, number what we have configured as part of the uh, load balancer right so uh, uh, sorry as part of the auto scale right so that that's how the logic what we have okay now, let's go back to the scaling up algorithm again so go ahead So now we are going to run four instances, right? Right. We can do four or twenty-four, whatever you want. So let yeah. me start with the four ten. Yeah. See, the current state is going to be available node one, and busy node is going to be zero. And Babu has triggered four parallel tests now, right? And in our uh, grid, we will see that. See, one one test is already running, so it is already running. And then we got two things which is there in the queue. And if we see our uh, Kubernetes uh, state now, you can see those three extra parts are going to be triggered. It's not uh, started because our autoscaler did not start at that. Let's wait for our autoscaler message to uh, start that. So th this is running every 70 seconds, right? So there should be a message coming up now, uh, scaling up required, and the current available node is one. And we need to scale it to four because the request which is there inside our selenium map is going to be three and that message has to come now. let's see so we got a message scale up is required the current scale is going to be four and the required scale is going to be uh, like a kind of three why it is uh, telling three the reason why is the first request is completed with the free node which is already there right so the three queues which is running uh, which is there in the selenium map that requires a new node to execute so that's the reason why it told the three. Now three instances should get uh, created in Kubernetes. Uh, three parts should get created in Kubernetes now. Let's see. see here. Now the current state has become three. And with this particular three instance, uh, the underlying uh, uh, say request should get uh, executed. It's slowly coming up, right? Yeah. Takes a... So we got the three instance now, and it is getting all the three are busy now. If you see, this is also busy, and this is also busy, and this is also busy, right? And this this is the kind of technique what we used in order to uh, say scale up and scale down 
automatically based on the number of requests which is queued in the token. Right. So that covers most of our required conversation to go after the solution. Right. And let's go. Uh, I think if you have questions, we are going to take questions around it. Uh, Manoj, I believe we are uh, on time and we've got 10 minutes to take any questions that we have. Sure, Babu. Um, I think we can stop the screen share if um, there's nothing more to share. Um, thanks for sharing. I think uh, there was some nice setup. Um, I think there is around 30, 30 plus questions. I'm not sure if we have enough time to go over all of them. Uh, but before we get on to um, all the other questions that were asked, I think one of the perks being a host, um, I have one question to ask. Is this open source? It's completely open source. We are going to push it to the GitHub uh, repo. And um, so even one of the other questions you might all have is, what if RPM 2.0, I'm migrating from one to two, is this solution would work? Absolutely, it should work. Uh, with the minimal, all that you have to do is the Dockerized images, rest all Terraform uh, to rest of the code bases are going to be safe. So we are going to give a sample app, everything going to be on a GitHub for you, including the Spring Boot apps, and also the entire code base. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's great to add. All right. Um, first question, is the solution built for Android alone? Yeah, currently this uh, present solution is completely built for Appium Android. That was our huge ask uh, because the number of uh, 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 combinations were too many for the customer. Uh, we have to look for a solution for iOS in the future, right? But technically, any web driver I was uh, should work on web driver, Selenium web driver API should work technically with the same solutions. Thank you for answering that. Next question from Parthiban Rajasekaran. Um, was there any specific reason behind using the Spring Boot service app instead of using an open source multi cluster orchestration platform like Rancher? Uh, fundamentally, the idea behind what we want to do is we want to build a custom uh, code base for our own uh, implementation. Uh, the fundamental solution that we thought about is how do we look at the queues of the grid because we had an underlying um, uh, platform solution that we built for our uh, existing environments. So we were trying to use the existing Selenium grid implementations to see how do we scale up. So that, that was the uh, regular ask. And then uh, being comfortable with the Spring Boot, writing our own code basis. So that, that's what we did. So we never thought about looking at the other alternate solutions, but open to, open to think through when we are looking at broader categories. But Great. by the way, good question. Thank you. Great. Thanks for answering that. Um, next question from an anonymous attendee, but it's really a good question. Um, did this really mean, uh, I mean, did this switch really meant that you migrated from doing a uh, real device testing to emulators when you were actually trying to run in ports? So we have, as, as I answered this, we had two asks, right? One is a bigger coverage, same time the cost should be the lowest. So as I told Pareto of Pareto, so we did the 4% of the devices running on, on, on our retail customers. So 4% of the devices, which is largely went onto the cloud providers, right? Actually SaaS labs. So, and the rest of them were running on our, uh, basically it's found to be very costly. So we are building our own um, environment to scale up and scale down. So that, that's where we built this solution, especially for virtual devices alone, uh, running out on our own cloud solutions, right? That, that's a fun time. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next question again from an anonymous attendee uh, and also during the live uh, demo session, uh, we have seen that uh, Babu and Gaji were using Selenium Grid 3 implementation. Uh, but the question here asked is, uh, given now Selenium Grid 4 is coming, um, how the solution is going to adapt? And if we want to use it, what are the changes uh, that we would want to? Right. That, that, yeah. That's a good question. I, I think I've been following Selenium Grid for, for a, quite a long as Manoj, truly along with you at times. So. So one of, one of the challenges right now we are at a Selenium 2 doesn't give us the API calls so that we don't know how many free nodes. So what we did in this case is uh, we were using the older solutions, right? So which basically trying to get the informations, right? And uh, it's not truly API. 
But when you switch to Selenium grade four, we have implemented in such a way that if you want to switch to grade four, all that you have to do is the APIs are built in. So it will go and get you the BC nodes, free nodes, and the queued up nodes. But we don't need the free nodes and BC nodes, right? So we just need the queued services. The rest of the ones are going to the Kubernetes part. So all that we do is we call the API actually to find out how many uh, queued requests are coming in Selenium 4. That should work. So fundamentally, it works on Selenium 2 and Selenium 4. Right? So either case. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for answering that. Um, next question I would pick from Mahesh Chaudhar. I think, where have you written logic to distribute the test cases? If I want to execute 100 test cases, how test will get distributed equally to available ports? So actually, it depends on your infrastructure, if I'm right. So you find out what is the size of an infrastructure. So if you had a 64 CPU metal like what we had, uh, you can just spin as many as you want. If you don't have a dependency of your test, just spin everything. You still have a very, very cheap cost on on spot where it's costing about a dollar, dollar, dollar yeah. just yeah, a dollar, dollar, dollar uh, yeah. for an hour. And you could you could be able to run like if your test is not too long, if you could spin on so many and you could be able to complete them pretty, pretty cheaper, right? So that's some logic you can look at. In case if you had an infrastructure constraint or dependency constraints, you can have a, a constraint either at your test runner level, like test and GJ unit level, or you can go ahead and have it at the grid level where you can see what is the size you want it to limit to, or you can do it at the Kubernetes part level. What, what is the configuration we had for the max nodes? Max, max nodes 20. Max nodes that we had by default, but that's, that's what you're going to have it in your Terraform also, but you, are, you, you can do it as you want it based on your infra. See, the current i3 metal can take up to 64 nodes, but if for this particular project, demo project, we just restricted to max nodes as well. Right. Awesome. Um, the next question uh, is from Rahul Pauja. I think is more of a comment. Uh, this is just awesome stuff. Um, do we document with internal representation and implementation for this solution for the open source community? If yes, please, can you share? Um, if not, any plans to? Uh, yeah, we, we will about? absolutely share and we will use this uh, conference as the medium to share it to the entire community and uh, glad and that motivates us to do a lot more. Cool. Um, another question um, from anonymous attendee. Um, how will we ensure that at the time of scale down, Selenium Grid doesn't send any request to that pod since there will be a little lag between pod going down and updating it to the Selenium Hub? Right. We don't use uh, Selenium Hub to detach from the uh, pods. The pods are being shut down. At Pods are being shut down at the Kubernetes level through the API calls. So, which means the disconnection would happen. I think if you are using Selenium 2 for a while, you would have seen if one of your node goes down, it takes a disconnection. It takes a while for detaching the node from the services. But if you do it Selenium 4, it's a little faster indeed. So technically it depends on what you're doing. So, uh, so we don't want to restart the hub because there is running services. So we let it to detach and let the cool down happen. So it depends on your, again, based on the infra, you want to shut down quicker or you want to let some time to shut down after your test suites are done or your tests are done by a module or something. You, you decide how do you want to do it. But technically, um, if you're using Selenium Grid 2, leave a little more cool down time as we did in the demo. It takes about 60 seconds by default by configurations to detach. Cool. Nice one. Um, next question I would pick from um, Thorsten Doubleman. Um, how did you build the Android nodes? slash ports, I would expect it should contain an Android emulator inclusive of Android SDK, doesn't it? And if yes, how did you cope with the large footprint of CPU, RAM, you know, usually that have Android emulators have? Uh, it's true. Actually, what we did is basically in the initial runs, we had the Android uh, RPM Docker image and we kept it at the Docker hub. And the problem is when we are sp spinning about uh, multiple nodes, it's becoming very expensive calls to do it. So what we did is basically we moved to Amazon ECR. ECR, ECR. Yeah. And then we put them uh, at the initial uh, sketch. You do the minimum part. We pushed it to the ECR. And from ECR, it sh should be able to do it locally. It took less than 30 seconds to uh, bunch in 5 GB, 5 GB, 5, 5, 5 to GB. something GBs to do the imaging. It happens in less than 30 seconds, right? Again, CPU, um, again, as I told you on the 
uh, if you are using Android RPM one, so you, you you have to make sure what what you take as a mission. So we took a metal, so which had a very large CPU, right? and, vir and virtualization enabled. That's that's ours, right? So. Nested virtualization. Yeah. So then only the Android emulator can start. If nested virtualization is not there, Android emulator cannot start. And i3 Metal is the instance type in AWS which supports that. Uh, in GCP, there is a issue. Google Compute Platform has that particular virtualization enabled, whereas Google Kubernetes cluster, GKE, does not have the worker nodes to have virtualization enabled. In Azure, it is possible. There are some node types in Azure where nested virtualization is available. Cool. Um, I'll just I'll just one last question. Uh, which one should I pick up? There's still a few more. Um, I think there was uh, similar questions around um, different build versions of APK file. How would you handle it? I think this was answered yeah. a while ago. Um, is the is all the device getting launched is of same capabilities? I think that's a question from Ratna. Uh, so actually, it depends on what you want to do it. These are all something you can write in the Terra form and you can have multiple uh, parts and you can have a multiple replica set, correct? So that's what we did. We had an 8 to 11, but I think we give you Nexus. We have a Samsung. We also have a real devices. So you, you can able to download that particular Docker image and set it on your Kubernetes, right? So depends on your request, which goes from your RPM client, you will be able to uh, actually choose. Yeah, choose, choose it and Kubernetes can help you to replicate your minimum part to as many as you want. Cool, thank you. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank Babu and Gajendran for the wonderful session and most importantly, making it open source. Um, I'm sure uh, with the comments and uh, you know uh, questions coming in, a lot of people are interested in this. Uh, and thank, thank, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone.